Okay, recording is started. So we are going to jump right in. Obviously, um, we had an opportunity to spend some time with you yesterday. We are going to go through these five main sections today, the brand score, prime five, main changers, targeted 10, and roadmap, and have recommendations for you all in each of those categories. Um, obviously, the place I always like to start and where we spent some time yesterday was with brand score. And um, as you all went through this exercise and kind of did the self-scoring, you landed at a 38. Um, this is not like school. This is, uh, this is not a standard grading scale, even though it is a 100-point scale. Typically, what we find is most programs are going to exist somewhere in uh, the mid-30s to, to maybe mid-50s, um, ones that have kind of gone through pretty comprehensive branding processes and have a lot of tools in place. They're going to start to edge up into um, the mid-60s and low-70s, and it is only the most um, sophisticated of communication organizations that are kind of getting into that. 75 85 range so don't beat yourself over uh, up over 38 38 is not horrible and it's also not a measure of um what your graphics look like it's a measure of the implementation so as we jump into this i think we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about some of the different organizational dynamics and you all have experienced what many, many communities do where you will have a logo. Um, that logo will then start to creep into other identities and other organizations and other uses. So um, there is this kind of blend between the URA, which is Main Street URA. We've got that whole complication we'll do with in a minute. Um, but then we also have the adoption of the graphic package by the city and the implementation of the graphic package through the wayfinding signage. So in addition to that, we have this kind of interesting work that came out of uh, Warehouse tw it's 21, right, Matt? Warehouse 21 um, yep. out of Cheyenne. And it was a little bit more targeted at promotional pieces, kind of a brochure and video set. Um, we were able to study the, the kind of brand package there. And again, really good work, but not necessarily the components that are intended to be a community-wide brand. So I, I want to ask a little bit of, of grace and forgiveness. As you can imagine, everything that I've created and going to share with you today has been done since yesterday. And um, it's not the byproduct of a holistic branding process. But I want to use it to kind of illustrate some of the points for you all to consider. Um, you know, when we started to look at the different things, I mean, there is this organizational confusion. So at times where you want to look like a part of the city, you definitely look like a part of the city. There is absolutely no reason that anyone would think that the Main Street URA is anything other than the city. Graphically, that's what it says. Um, in fact, there's more brand gap between the Parks and Recreation Department than there is URA. And, um, and in Parks and Rec, that's, that's very definitely like holistically part of the city. But from an identity standpoint, they have a whole different uh, logo system that they're using. So one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to throw out a package that would allow you to start to own a little bit of the dynamics that you're trying to control there in the community where you are the stewards of a district. Um, so the first thing I want to introduce is this idea that in a community, you have to have a dual brand system. And what that is, is we need to start separating out the difference between the destination brand. And with you all, you have Evanston, Wyoming, and then you have that subset of downtown Evanston. And then in the organization, we have our city, we have our Main Street, we have our URA, we have all those different entities, the chamber and everything. Um, in the world of kind of brand co-oping and brand confusion, you know, what is the chamber's logo? Well, the chamber straight up is using the Wyoming Business Council logo. 
and just put chamber on there, you know? So it, it's like being able to realize there's certain times where we want to be able to, to have awareness that we are an entity unto ourselves. And then there are other times that connectivity is really, really important. But that separation between destination and organization is a really, really good thought process to have. Now, with this, I, I wanted to start with colors. Um, I know that you have some colors that really uh, have been used consistently and they've kind of leaned towards a red as a primary. But what I actually did was I did a series of photo studies throughout your downtown where I would input images into this program called Adobe Color and would generate different color palettes based off of what am I seeing in the photo. And now all of a sudden, instead of colors simply being pretty, <laughs> they're now directly derived from your place. And it's kind of interesting what starts to happen there when you have colors that are derived from your place, because then all of a sudden you find those colors seem to match up with the place very well. So obviously we have a couple of different tones that kind of come out of our brick tones. We have this very, very interesting turquoise that's seen both on um, the Blythe and Fargo um, ghost sign, but then also that ghost sign in the background. We've got some uh, rich blues. And what I actually landed on is I landed on a six color palette that allow us to kind of land in the earth tones, but then also bringing in um, some of those different blues. And you'll see how that materializes through the system. But again, you know, does it have to be these colors? Absolutely not. But the colors at least come from somewhere. <laughs> you know, you can say, well, where'd that come from? Well, we took a picture of downtown. Those colors are literally derived from downtown. And then from there, I started to look at typefaces. One of the things that you really want is you want a consistent approach to typeface. Um, you all have had a very, very inclusive design um, philosophy when it comes to the URA. And what I mean by that is you are glad to include any typeface that you choose to use at the moment. And, um, <laughs> and you know, sometimes there's this mindset that the more we can use, the better we are. And, and I will say that just because your computer has 140 um, typefaces on it, that's not a challenge to use them all. Um, so being able to, to narrow with that down a little bit. And what I did is I selected three different typefaces. The primary is the one that I was really honing in on the word Evanston. This is where I want you to see the power of consistently using the same word type over and over again. The secondary is a sans serif. These typefaces are designed to be content neutral. They're super clean. They're super legible. Um, and they I think a lot of times people think that they're a little sterile, but they're not actually sterile. They're actually, they're really, really great baskets, if that makes sense. Um, they, they hold the positive experiences that people have. So it makes a really, really good selection for kind of a supplemental part of that system. And then that accent typeface is actually a very narrow horizontal scaled. Um, it's more of a period typeface. It's called Burton Base. It's derived off of um, the kind of railroad time period of some of the, the um, advertising that would have been used to actually recruit workers for the railroad. So I felt like that was kind of a fitting accent typeface to fit into the system. So and ben then talks we, about typeface like other people talk about wine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it, amazing. Well, and, and the thing that is so interesting about it is I think a lot of times the mindsets that we go through is um, we'll say Evanston's pretty. So we go and we pick this this script typeface that's not very legible and, and you can't read once you get, you know, um, 24 inches away. Or they say, well, we're historic. And then they pick papyrus. And it's like it, it really is not that easy. Like what you want to do is you want to actually lean on the side of being a little bit more reserved so that those typefaces truly serve as the thread stitching together all those things. And what you're getting ready to see is you're going to see how simply by bringing those colors and those typefaces into a system, I am going to rattle out all kinds of connections that you never really even thought of. And I was able to do them all in less than a day because the system makes you very, very efficient at communicating.
So with all that, that's what um, kind of brings your name into that typeface and, and just kind of giving that um, that simple star in the center of the O, it kind of ties into this. I mean, to me, as a person who is kind of drawn to the personality of Wyoming, um, I feel like Wild West and, and kind of the idea of the West is this amazing and uniquely American thing. There is a, a pride and energy attached to it. And just being able to kind of tie into that, especially with that idea of one of your transformational strategies, being that day tripper, that's focused on the outsider end. Um, and when you can walk a line of a little bit of kind of American adventure and patriotism all in the same place, people are really, really good with that. Um, now, I want to spend a second talking about trains because trains can be really hard. First of all, when you have a locomotive aficionado, they're gonna be able to tell you exactly which model 4420 was. They're gonna be able to tell you that that's not our train. They're gonna be able to tell you Union Pacific never ran a locomotive like that. You get into a really, really scary dynamic whenever you start to go down the literal road. But then the other thing that is really interesting is if you study the way that people kind of convey the steam locomotive, um, there typically are three main kind of realms of how they do it. The simplest is a side silhouette. Um, these scale down really small, but the problem is no matter how good that side silhouette is, it is always going to make you feel a little bit like you're playing Monopoly because every single kid knows that those four railroads on the Monopoly board are that just simple locomotive icon. So, you know, you've got to figure out, are we willing to maybe feel a little playful, maybe feel a little childish, maybe play, you know, be associated with the game. And, and that's not necessarily where we want to be if we're doing economic development and that kind of stuff. The middle image is you know, once you get past um, that side angle, anytime you do a three quarter angle, um, you have to add some detail to it because without the detail, you lose the perspective. There is definitely a fine line of how much detail is too much detail. You don't need a literal pen and ink illustration like on the right. You wanna land somewhere in the middle without it being too detailed. But I will say, um, as I started to dig into this, it, it, trying to incorporate sun, river, locomotive, buildings, all in a singular composition, you're never gonna get out of a, a busyness factor. It is simply a combination of elements and textures that when they come together, there is a baseline and below that baseline, you will never be able to simplify it more. So um, this, is, this is the road I first started walking down. And it's like, okay, can we clean this up? Can we do things that feel a little bit better, that feel a little bit more kind of in line with the spirit but as I kept doing this, I mean, now all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, we do have a, a locomotive derived from 4420. It doesn't have all the same domes, but I didn't have time. Um, you know, it's got your building. It's got, you know, that kind of reminiscence of the, the original logo. But, you know, as I was doing this, I was like, these this community seems cooler than this and these people seem cooler than this. And what would I do if I didn't have to worry about people's feelings? So I'm going to ask you to pause for just a second on this. And, uh, you know, I just kind of opened the door. Um, so again, we're going to hit on that destination brand first. And what I landed on after looking at historic documents and, and one of the cool things I love is looking at historic maps especially early plat maps as a community starts to truly become a community and, and get its identity. I mean, I love the fact that Evanston might be named for James Ed Evans or it might be named for John Evans. Don't really know. Doesn't matter. They were both cool. Civil engineer, politician, you know, great backstories in either direction. I, I love that history. Um, so 
what I did was I landed on something that kind of looks like this, just a nice kind of stylized kind of Western character driven monogram. You introduce that idea of downtown Evanston, what we talked about yesterday, the perfect dose of Wyoming. You know, you start to have that tool that it becomes a little bit easier to use. And this really is intended simply to be a brand mark for the downtown, something that the businesses can have, something they can make merchandise off of. Um, being able to have a system that actually works where you can go one color with it, you can scale it down, you can simply use the word type, um, you don't always have to use the graphic. This starts to build that system that allows you to kind of tell that story and, and grow some legs behind it where you're not dealing with the same level of complication. You got some texture to it, but it's, it's still very reproducible. And then this is where I think it gets kind of interesting. We took your two transformational strategies and we tried to simplify those down to concepts that were easier to run through the filter. Feel at home, that's our family friendly. You know, are we doing things? Are we doing activities? Are we creating places? Are we investing in projects? Are we doing things that are preserving that hometown feel? And then that day tripper crossed the line. And it's a little bit of that, you know, we had that great conversation yesterday about um, lottery, was it lottery liquor and, um, and life, you know? <laughs> so um, being, being able to kind of take that, um, that interesting kind of slightly edgy, just a little bit adventurous, a little bit of a, um, foreign experience, you know, and this idea of crossing the state line. And, and, you know, now all of a sudden, you through that branding system and through simply incorporating that monogram, you start to own concepts. And simply by slapping that E in, you own this idea of feeling at home. You own this idea of crossing the line. And those are the things that you can kind of stitch together and maybe better fit under that idea of transformational strategies. Transformational strategies are not intended to be more work. Um, they're intended to give you purpose and break down those silos between your committees to make sure that you are efficiently moving towards the realization of a vision for the community. So what really gets cool with this though is once you have this system in place, you can start to easily create these different extension and expansion pieces. So whether you're going through and you're kind of talking about the rail yards and you just kind of create this monogram E out of rail timber, hey, you know, very simple. That's owning those elements that you want. Um, with a simple system like this, you, it becomes easy to wrap your arms around these amenities. I know that right now the uh, roundhouse and rail yards have a singular logo, and that's fine. But being able to kind of talk about those elements as parts of this overall brand is also important. So it's not as much that we need roundhouse and rail yards to change their logo as it is, we now have ways to tie them into the downtown story. Owning the river, you know, and, and being able to take that asset that you might not necessarily connect with downtown in terms of an experience, um, it is important for you to connect it to the downtown. Outdoor recreation is great, but it happens outdoors. And in the outdoors, there aren't a lot of stores. So if people are using your stuff and not leaving their money behind, you're not realizing the economic impact of your outdoor recreation amenities. So making that connection between your downtown and those outdoor kind of magnetic draws, that is really, really important for us. We wanna make sure that downtown Evanston is the base camp of an outdoor experience so that you're priming yourself for kind of that exploration of downtown to be part of the exploration of the community. Does that make sense? I can't tell whether you're silent because you hate it or you're just like drinking the fire hose. Um, <laughs> You know, even amenities like, you know, bringing in uh, 4420 and, and being able just to kind of own that, that interesting piece of history. 
Um, so you start to see with that very, very basic foundation, it becomes really easy to start to stitch these ideas together. And then that brings us back to the organization. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a different road here. Um, this is probably a little different from the way that we typically would handle this. Um, and, you know, Matt and I spent some time really talking about what do we want to do and what do we want to say? Um, when we were in Rock Springs, Rock Springs had a downtown Rock Springs logo and that was it. So they were literally using a destination logo for everything. They had absolutely no way to say, we did this. They had no way to, to share understanding there. Um, you all are a little different. You have an organizational logo. And the big question that we have to ask ourselves is, how does this all fit? And um, how does URA and Main Street fit together? Um, is it just Main Street URA? Is that, is that sexy? Like, is that the thing that's gonna draw people out? Um, is the name recognition more with urban renewal? And we just need to do a better job of communicating that we're utilizing the Main Street approach to revitalization. And, um, and you know, that was one of the challenges that we kind of landed on. And Matt, I don't know if you wanna kick in some of the thoughts. I know, cause with you being on the ground, um, you kind of weighed in a little on where you felt like we needed to fall on it. Yeah, I mean, every time we had a meeting, individuals said different things about the organization. Um, we even had individuals think that there is a separate Main Street board from the Urban Renewal Authority board. So, um, and, and that was, a, I believe, a city council member. So, you know, there is distinct confusion as far as what this body is, what you do, who you are. And so making sure that you have kind of that singular message of, okay, this is who we are and this is how we do it really needs to be portrayed because that confusion starts to lead to, well, who's doing this and who are those people and who are these people? And um, if, if people are trying to focus on the setup of the organization, they're not focusing on the meat of what you're doing. And so trying to use these branding strategies to be able to explain the impact of the organization is really what we want you to be able to do. You need to be able to talk about what, what it is you're doing um, and, and the impact that you're having rather than have people stop and say, oh gosh, well, I wait a minute, I'm confused. You know, are, are you this group? Are you that group? Are you part of the city? Are you not? Um, because once they get distracted by that, you know, shiny squirrel, your message is diluted. You know, they're, they're not thinking about anything else other than who the heck are these people? So I, I think through the organizational um, logos, we're trying to set it up so that you have the ability to start to tell that story effectively and get people past the name and into the meat of what you offer. Absolutely. And the big thing that I always like to do with our downtown organizations is that, I mean, the approach is typical across America. They love to slap a, a streetscape, you know, they love to slap a lamppost on it. They love to slap historic buildings on it. Um, what do we want to be seen as? We want to be seen as contemporary, competent, effective, trustworthy, an organization that has the capabilities and capacity to truly deliver. And um, so I always lean a little bit more on like a clean and confident look. And so what I was throwing together for you all looks like this. Again, tying in uh, to the railroad pattern, um, bringing in our four colors of the four point approach, but really becoming Evanston Urban Renewal. And then every time you use that acronym, it is always coupled with the phrase powered by URA. And now all of a sudden it's like people are too prone to drop into the acronym. They talk about URA, but if we don't ever convey it that way on any of our marketing, then we're losing that, that connection. So being able to, in a single place, 
have the place that you serve, have the organization's name come to the top, but then also a Wyoming Main Street program, tying it into that statewide and national network. With that four color approach and that four kind of segmented icon, it allows you to tell that story of promotion, design, organization, economic vitality. And it just creates a really nice kind of clean feel. It's like, okay, this is an organization. This is not a place. This is an organization that's doing things. Now, with that, I know that that's obviously a, a complete departure from where you are, but the reason that I feel comfortable uh, with that is because I feel like the city itself is now that they have adopted that pre-existing logo, it is most appropriate for that image and that, that graphics package to kind of live on through that city logo and is going to continue obviously to exist through your wayfinding signage. But even within the city itself, being able to have a slightly more sophisticated logo for Rocco as, as he goes through and kind of targets economic development. You know, you don't wanna to have to try to sell a $7 million development project with, you know, a locomotive necessarily. Like that's not necessarily what you're looking for. So, you know, economic development could have something a little bit cleaner. It could have something a little bit more contemporary that just ties into that understanding that different parts of the organization need different tools to be able to perform their job. So uh, again, I'm throwing these out there, not as much to say, oh, this is an awesome logo, you should do it this way, as it is, these are the different approaches that these different facets of this community should consider as they work in concert. It's kind of like, you don't want a tuba player to try to sound like the piccolo. You want the tuba to be the tuba and the piccolo to be the piccolo. So being able to make sure that everybody knows their role in the symphony. So now as we kind of go through that, we start to see this evolution of that destination brand that is um, accessible to all and that organizational awareness brand for urban renewal. And then it really starts to get fun because based off of the same foundation, you know, the Strand Theater, this, this property that, that you helped to, to kind of run and, and manage, like it's it's part of this, you know, they can have the brand mark for the organization, they can simply have a graphic version of the sign itself. And just like it's confusing on the city side, the Strand Theater is a perfect encapsulation of confusing, because the Strand Theater is the destination, and Sagebrush Theater Productions is the organization that is activating the theater, right? So being able to have those different opportunities for the organizations and and amenities in the community to kind of tie in to the system, showing how that brand system can kind of go out and, and connect those dots. You've got some great stuff going on with the farmer's market. So, you know, being able to see that brand extension there um, and you just showing a little bit about how the, the, the approach to design starts to, to evolve as, as you've got these different components that you can use. Um, and then even, you know, not that this is for Brenda, wink, wink, but, you know, if you know anybody who makes t-shirts, um, you know, trying to go through and just show how with a system like this, it becomes a lot easier to make merchandise. And, and I will tell you, one of the biggest things that I'm a believer of, and I've been doing this a long time, when you have that destination brand, give it away give it to the people, give it to the businesses, allow businesses to figure out ways to profit off of it. Because there is nothing better for a community than a positive connection between its people, its citizens and visitors, and the business community. And if you can find ways to, to kind of carry that brand through into branded merchandise, then you are making it unbelievably appealing and you're supporting your business community. So it's a really, really great tactic to have. So with everything that I've shown, that would get you essentially up to a 72. So that's pretty doggone good for a day's worth of work, right? Before we go forward, do y'all want to talk about that at all? I mean, what are your thoughts all in all? Does the strategy seem to make sense and some of those kind of fundamental concepts of what we're trying to convey? Does that seem to, to maybe be a, a, a slightly different way of, of maybe how you looked at it? 
This is Jane. I, I think it's awesome. It's exciting. It um, makes sense. And Good. it simplifies everything. And Brenda was grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I appreciate it. And I find it interesting that you pulled those colors from downtown and that picture and stuff. But I, I like it. I think it's, it's to the point. It's... Uh, it, it's cool. And just so you know, for a long time, I tried to use Jester on everything because I thought Evanston was fun. Right. <laughs> thought, you can't use it anymore. So anyway, I I think it, I, I like it. I think it's interesting and, and cool. Cool. Do you, well, do you feel it helps explain who you are and what you do more effectively? I mean, because I, I think that is the main thing that you need to be able to do with these tools is to say, all right, this is what this means and, and kind of avoid some of that confusion. Yeah. I like how it stated um, Evanston Urban Renewal, a Wyoming Main Street program. I thought that was a good separation. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. And just so you all know, and, and it might only be Brenda that cares, but um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all all of the art files. I'm going to give you all of the vector art. I'm going to give you variations of all that stuff. I will give you all the typefaces and define all the colors. And please feel free, use that as a springboard. They are yours. They are yours to edit. They're yours to adapt. Um, I, all I will tell you is that's what I was able to do in a day. I don't know that you need to spend four months refining it. I think that um, I have found that refinement through implementation instead of refinement through consensus is a really great way. You know, start to use it, see what you like, see what works, because you're not Coca Cola. And as long as you're not going out, and having them cast in $55,000 metal letters everywhere, I think you're fine. You know, there's nothing that you're going to do that you can't massage as you kind of go through and use it. So um, hopefully there'll be some seeds there that, that really start to stick and, and will make that job a little bit easier. But um, we do feel like that's a, a pretty good step forward. Now, let's kick it into second gear, Matt, because I know that we've got... Um, with our late start, we want to get through this pretty quickly. I do want you all to know we have created summary documents for each of the five audiences that will be included in the package. They describe uh, strategic tactics of how to communicate to audiences, what measurable results by the audiences might be, some targets on um, what typically communities don't necessarily do as good communicating to in those audiences. And then we documented some of the things that were unique to your community. So we've literally created different versions of this. These are the kind of things that are better to dig into anyway. If you have any questions, let us know. But all five of those will be included in this final package and will help you as you start to tackle those strategies for um, communicating to the folks in the community that you wanna raise that awareness. And then that carries us into the main changers. And in this main changers section, um, Matt, I'm going to let you kind of lead the conversation here because you did some really, really great work with putting this content together. Yeah, so the, the main changers is basically a way to start thinking about the messages that you're going to plant and hopefully have those seeds grow over time. So are you talking with somebody that is a potential volunteer? Are you talking with an elected official, um, a business owner? There are common threads of things that each of those individual audiences that motivate them. Uh, and that's really what those prime five sheets outlines are. Okay, this is what this group really cares about. And once you kind of get that in your mind, you're able to start telling that story in a way that makes that message stick to them. So often we tell stories and it's like, well, this is what I care about. And, you know, as a, a as a participant in downtown Evanston, I want to have a cool factor and I want to experience something. Well, that's going to be a totally different message than might be needed to talk to an elected official. 
They're thinking tax base, they're thinking jobs, economic development. They're also thinking a four year election cycle, you know, so legacy, how long can, how long do I have before I may or may not be in office to get a project done? So once you kind of understand that thought process of what the motivators are, you're able to start looking at main changers, which are storylines to be able to start to tell those stories. So. So where we, we ended up was coming up with these key threads of discussion that hopefully these end up becoming your go-to as board members to be able to say, when I'm in a conversation about Evanston Urban Renewal and somebody asks me what it's, what it's about, you can default to some of these as your conversation starters and then start to personalize the discussion to what it is you want to talk to them about individual examples that you're comfortable with or maybe a project that you volunteered on so uh, the first one is we're an overnight success 40 years in the making well you know this is that push pull that you all kind of brought forth yesterday of gosh we've done so many great things but people are always wanting to know what have you done for me lately and so making sure that you're communicating, this gives you that ability to say, hey, don't forget what we've done over 40 years. And yes, here's a project that we did, you know, this past year, the installation of the, the clock, um, the mural that was painted. But don't forget that the roundhouse has taken a lot of time, a lot of effort. And those are some big projects that we're standing on the shoulders of to make this a great community. So, um, you know, certainly the uh, messages for a volunteer would be, holy cow, I want to be a part of that type of project. I want to be able to walk into the, the roundhouse and be able to tell my family that I had a part in this. Uh, it's a little bit of the, I did that envy. You know, if you can cultivate that feeling of, oh my gosh, I want to be, I want to be like Jim Davis. How, I mean, I want to be like Jim Davis to be able to say, gosh, I had a hand in that. And, and that is one of the best motivators for volunteers uh, in the world. Uh, for the public, um, you know, we want them to be saying, hey, have you been to an event at the Strand yet? You know, and, and build that excitement that that's an expectation. Uh, for property owners, you know, the message there is about value. Um, I remember when the Hotel Evanston was on the verge of collapse. My property's worth more now that it's stabilized. So again, getting back to that value proposition, when you're talking to a property owner downtown, uh, you want to be able to communicate in ways that they can appreciate that, gosh, all this work that Evanston Urban Renewal has been undertaking is helping my property value in increase. And, th and that's a positive thing. Uh, for investors, Evanston Urban Renewal is a solid partner. Uh, so, you know, they've got my back. They're here to help me. Uh, and then elected officials, I'm proud of the homegrown revitalization uh, that's been created. So, uh, again, kind of getting back to that idea that we're not necessarily looking for the outsiders to come in and save us. Uh, but uh, the Evanston Urban Renewal is homegrown revitalization. So... Uh, kind of tapping into that pride. Uh, this idea of don't be afraid to cross the line. Uh, we kind of played off of that discussion of, you know, it's a little bit edgy to, to cross that line. And, uh, but we wanted to welcome folks in for that day trip. Uh, and, you know, the idea just 2.53 miles separate Utah from a good time, you know. So you can really start to tell that story about that day tripper uh, and and it's, it's, your, it's your transformational strategy, but it's a way to talk about it that's comfortable and, and, and connects with people rather than being the Dave Tripper jargon, you know, uh, that just doesn't really land real well with folks. It makes sense. It's a good concept, but this just packages it and makes it easier for you to talk about, hey, <laughs> let's invite people to come and cross that line. So, um, you know, the storylines there uh, for volunteers, 
hey, I'm bringing people together. Uh, for visitors, I wonder what's going on in Evanston this week. Um, for property owners, you know, they're seeing these efforts of the day trippers as bringing uh, customers to their stores, to the community, generating that sales tax. And that's also um, another uh, elected official message. So you want to make sure that you're demonstrating how you're adding to the local economy through this cross the line campaign, you know, bringing people to the community. So once you start to see how these different pieces fit together uh, and those motivators, you can start talking to people about the program in a way that anticipates what their values are. Um, so you're funding cool. Uh, we heard this one yesterday. I think this came out of this group uh, here. Uh, and, uh, you know, with 40 years under our belt, uh, we're entering middle age and welcoming a midlife crisis. But unlike the hipster dad who's just trying a bit too hard, our efforts only add to the allure of this place. If there's one lesson we've learned since the start of this revitalization effort, it's that progress never stops. And I think that is really an important component that, you know, you are really taking year in and year out efforts to make this community a better place. Uh, and so, you know, kind of communicating that lesson of information over the years, uh, you know, improvements over the years to be able to say, okay, we did these great big projects. You know, the strand is huge. The hotel is huge. The roundhouse is huge. But those are items that are not going to fill in the gaps. You need the smaller victories year after year to be able to point to and say, hey, we did the clock tower. We're doing the lights across the street. Um, you know, the, the bulbs, uh, the flowers in the, um, in the streetscape are just amazing, you know. And to be able to highlight on those things that, hey, we are making improvements year after year um, keeps, keeps it relevant. Um, because I think after a little bit of time, people forget what it was like before the improvement was made. So this storyline uh, helps you to do that. Volunteers, you know, my sweat equity is making for a place uh, where the, it's exciting. Um, property owners, I don't want to be the curmudgeon on the block. You know, I, I, need, to, I need to buy into this and, and hopefully get moving. Uh, and then elected officials, I want to be the leader that brought cool back to Evanston. So, you know, those are just some messages to be able to tie into this, uh, this thematic. Uh, and then uh, yesterday afternoon, we heard uh, that uh, some folks call it Evanston. And, and that was just a, a great, great turn of phrase. Um, and, you know, this idea of being the landing pad where a lot of people are moving to. Um, and one of the key things that we heard was the concern of volunteers, uh, volunteer recruitment. Again, you're 40 year old organization. So you're seeing a transition of folks that have been here for a long time kind of saying, yeah, I'm looking to downshift into a, maybe a little bit slower lifestyle as far as volunteering goes, but you need to be picking up those new volunteers. Uh, and uh, really getting folks involved. So, um, you know, the other thing is uh, making sure that you're communicating to uh, the city and the elected officials of, hey, this is what our volunteers are doing and all of those things that have gotten done. Gosh, imagine if we had to pay for all that. You know, the value of the volunteers is unbelievable in this community and being able to kind of promote that message of, hey, uh, it is making a difference. So, so hopefully this makes sense in terms of being able to package those messages for those different audiences. Um, we thought that uh, an idea of a social media campaign uh, of uh, like a throwback Thursday uh, with an overnight success uh, and basically posting pictures of kind of some of the, what these buildings were before um, maybe having the derelict photos of, you know, reminding people it doesn't have to be a one and done kind of thing. Um, you know, you could post these monthly uh, and recycle them every year, you know, because people do need to be reminded of the progress that's been made. So I did do that for a little while, a few years ago, just to kind of remind people and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. And it was fun. And then 
all of a sudden you forgot a day and then you forgot a week. Yeah, it yeah. gets to be pretty easy. So yeah. Well, and then from there, we wanted to go ahead and start to put together some examples of what a slide deck, just kind of an introduction to Evanston Urban Renewal, what it might look like. So we are Evanston Urban Renewal. We are revitalizing memorable places. We are re-energizing local business. We are inviting you to come together. We're reminding you how community feels. We are an engine and we are on track. What is Evanston <laughs> Urban Renewal? We're an overnight success nearly 40 years in the making. Operating under the management strategy of the Main Street Four Point Approach, we conduct activities to design a livable environment where people want to spend quality time. Organize a troop of volunteers where you can tap in and step up. Promote the best our proud heritage and small town living have to offer and supercharge economic vitality to generate thriving business and purpose-driven investment. And then you wanna take these, Matt? Yeah, so, you know, really talking to people about um, the activities that you undertake. Uh, the Main Street approach, again, it's a little bit jargony, you know, it kinda, it may not connect with people, particularly when you say economic revitalization or vitality. So if you wanna boil that down, what is Evanston economic, or Evanston Urban Renewal do? It's people, projects, and place. And people is about that connection of events and, and great experiences uh, to, you know, really create that experience in downtown Evanston. Um, you know, we heard that idea of visitors creating memories uh, was a really important value. So that's, that's the people component. The projects, projects uh, are the big hairy buildings that nobody else would ever dream of tackling. Uh, <laughs> transforming the, the diamonds in the rough and activating spaces that generate that foot traffic. Again, that linkage to business. Um, that's why you're tackling those, business, uh, those buildings is to make sure that you're not just making a beautiful building, but you're activating it and, and having an economic <laughs> impact uh, with that. And then finally, the, the place. And this is really where all of those placemaking details come in, wrapping into the, the fabric of the community. What's making this place stitch together? Those flowers, the banners, the lights, um, you know, the, the street activities uh, to really welcome people as they come to Evanston. And then to kind of round out, I mean, one of the things we'll be giving you is um, Matt got some shots while he was there on the ground, but this idea of starting to build a really robust photo library, there's nothing worse than trying to market a community and not having the images um, or having that really great shot from 1987 where, um, you know, you can tell by the size of the hair and the shoulder pads exactly what era it was from. <laughs> um, you know, you've got to make sure that you're keeping those things up to date and, and that you have um, not just a farmer's market picture, but when you go to the farmer's market, do you have photos of people setting the event up? Do you have detailed shots of the produce? Do you have detailed shots of products? Do you have detailed shots of the vendors, really personality shots? And one of the most important things, do you have transactional images like pictures of people buying things because isn't that what it's all about so it'll start to get you thinking a little bit more about those photo assets and then finally it kind of carries us to the roadmap and um matt i know one of the things that that we had kind of talked about was um getting your head wrapped around the transformational strategies and i will say um i, I think that you landed on two uh very very reasonable transformational strategies and um I think that the concept of a transformational strategy, people are still struggling with it. I shared this example from Two Rivers, Wisconsin. One of their transformational strategies literally is utilize existing assets to their fullest potential. Really? Like, that's a... <laughs> That's a strategy. Like, you know, I mean, I, I get it, but it's not very strategic. It's just common sense, you know. So I think that that a very nice tight focus of 
a family friendly community that feels like home and you know this this kind of exciting place to visit if, if it's a great place to live and a great place to visit you're nailing it you know so i think you've done a really really good job but that does kind of lead into some of the thinking and some of the stuff that that matt you saw with the strategic planning yeah they, you know you've got to have a written plan in place you've got to have something to be able to say here's where we're headed here's what we're going to do um, just to make sure that you can prioritize the efforts if one, one staff member and volunteers your resources are limited so you need to know how you're prioritizing those resources. Uh, and that would happen through a, a strategic plan. And the world is changing. You know, pandemic threw everything on its ear. We were talking this morning about the car lots and how the auto shortage of vehicles being available to purchase. Those things are gonna keep coming and they're gonna hit your main street as well as far as things that need to be responded to. So having a, a strategic plan in place will help you to start talking about all those different elements uh, as they change. Same thing, build out an annual work plan. Um, similar to the slide Ben just showed, I think that could be a template for the annual work plan, but you have to have a list of what it is you're gonna get done so that when all of those additional to-do items come in, you're able to say, okay, well, what are we gonna not get done that we approved earlier this year. Because otherwise it's gonna look, people are gonna say, oh, well, how come you didn't get this done? Well, we got all these 16 other things done, but I can't show you the list. It's, it's about making sure that people have that ability to understand truly what you're accomplishing, what you're trying to tackle and what you've done. Um, next item, uh, consider offering, uh, exploring the tools offered by Urban Renewal. You need to read the statutes. Um, go back, um, figure out what is offered through that program. Uh, it is a quasi-governmental power. It, it is not necessarily the same. So yesterday afternoon's discussion, we talked about, oh, well, could the urban renewal be part of the chamber? Eh, I don't think it necessarily can. Some of the Main Street functions absolutely overlap with similar chamber functions but urban renewal is a different animal and becoming more familiar with tax increment financing is really gonna be important for you to get developers in here working with the community and have that outside investment start to take place. So um, would really, really strongly encourage a discussion uh, with some folks that know urban renewal. Um, that's an important one. Uh, revisiting the brownfields uh, uh, uses on the rail yards. Um, it's an amazing facility, but it needs activation through a commercial use. Brewery is a good, good track. Hotel would be another really critical track for you to have down there. If you have a hotel on that site, your conference space will be rented out nearly every week of the year. And, and that activity, bringing people to that site and having them stay on that site is really important. So there are some technical nuances associated with that. Important to dig into, uh, figure out how to get to yes. Um, create an operations and management plan for the strand. So we heard some discussion about, well, it should be used more. Absolutely. It needs to be used. People need to be in that building. Figuring that out and again, documenting how that's gonna work, how it's gonna happen, who's doing what um, is really gonna be an important thing to make that a reality. Uh, because otherwise it, it's kind of like your work plan. It just, different things slide in, it gets lost in the shuffle. If you have it written down, it'll make a lot more sense for you to be able to check things off and say, yep, we got that figured out. Um, develop a template uh, for a monthly update. Uh, so having something that is basically generated off of either your board agenda, your summary memo for the year or for the month uh, that can be handed off to representatives to go to different meetings so that you all don't have to think about, oh gosh, what did we talk about this month? And, you know, I, I, I've been there, you know, it's like there's so much going on, uh, but if it's written down, you've got it quick at hand, you're able to organize it, 
and you're able to make sure that the rest of the, the city and folks that you're talking to have that update. Um, and then organizational mapping. Uh, so there is, again, I said a lot of confusion about who's doing what and what the boundaries are. Um, just laying it out in a simple table that says, here's the chamber, here's their geography, here's what they do and their mission is, here's ur urban renewal, here's community planning, here's um, the economic development board, just so everybody has it in one place and they can say, oh, okay, I understand how these pieces fit together. Because uh, I think that is probably one of the biggest struggles you as a community have right now. It's just everybody's kind of doing a lot of everything and there's not a whole lot of understanding and coordination between you know, where those overlaps are. So trying to make those a little bit more distinct, uh, I think would be a, a great help, so. And then to wrap that up, I'm just gonna give you a couple tools that you all can use. This is for the, the promotion committee where they can simply go through and just, it, it seems silly, but literally just going through and writing out every event that you plan and then identifying, is this a uh, image building event? Is this a special event? Is this a retail promotion? And then which audiences are we going to need to communicate to during the course of that event? Are we going to need volunteers? Are we going to need the public to come out? Are we going to need sponsors? Um, so it's just a really simple planning exercise for your event organizers, hopefully to make them think a little bit more strategically and holistically about the event schedule. And then the final thing is, a um, this is a communication channels worksheet. This is going to walk through uh, kind of looking at some of the, the tools that you do have, um, you know, thinking through the way that you use the Facebook pages. One example is, you know, right now you have, and if I'm, if I'm correct, it's the business owner subset of underneath URA where they have a Facebook page that is Main Street promoting, Main Street promotion, the, 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 that page, you know, and if it's the businesses promoting the district, you know, um, one of the things that you always want to kind of ask is, is, should that just be downtown Evanston? Like what, what is the identity of each of those pages? Um, do you have an internal page for the businesses to communicate to each other? And then is there a page that allows people to build that brand equity um, externally. So hopefully those will help a little bit. Again, they're not super difficult at all. They're just, they, they get you from being all over the place to kind of thinking holistically. So um, even though we started late, we did keep our presentation itself right at an hour. So um, do you all have any questions for us? I know some of you probably need to get out and, and get your day going, but we would love to entertain any questions or, or anything uh, that came out of it. Matt, I have a question for you. Yeah. Is there a resource where we can, I'm new to this obviously, but is there a resource where we can kind of visualize some of the best practices related to urban renewal in the state and maybe some TIF best practices and some use cases? Yeah, um, I, I need to get you in touch with my guy that's working on urban renewal. It is um, a tool that has not been effectively used in the state. Um, you know, essentially what, what you all are doing, your name is Urban Renewal, you're operating using the Main Street tools only. Right. And so uh, I think it's going to be more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, to be able to say, all right, what have you done? How are you operating? Um, and just have a conversation about uh, tax increment uh, and how it works, because uh, there's a whole lot of education that, that needs to take place. Uh, because it's not it's not simple, and I, I think that's probably why it hasn't been widely used, is that folks have found other ways to try and deal with the problems that urban renewal helps with, um, either other grant programs or other funding sources. Well, now with the finances at the state being what they are, suddenly those options aren't out there. So um, yeah, give, give me a call. Um, what I would suggest doing is setting up a a uh, webinar or conference call um, just with a, a one-on-one session, so, yeah. And I mean, those Great. can be, they can be very, very cool tactics when you layer things up. I mean, one of the, 
one of the coolest things that we worked on was when we were working in the communities on the Mississippi Gulf Coast after getting decimated by Hurricane Katrina. And um, we were using CDBG money to, we essentially seeded what we called a facade master plan. And um, in the city of Gulfport, we were able to renovate 110 facades using this federal money. There was a caveat. We had to be able to get the building owners to sign over a temporary easement just on the facade of their building so that their front of their building became public property for five years. We then used the CDBG to enhance and renovate and restore those facades, put awnings, put lighting, put signage. But what was interesting is before we did any of that, we laid down a tax increment financing district. So we leveraged the power of the CDBG and the automatic increase in the district's value to be able to go and do uh, either pay as you go or bonded infrastructure projects moving forward. And it is kind of funny if you've never played around with TIF very much. Um, I know that they're now legal in all 50 states. Uh, North Carolina was the 49th uh, state to pass it. And they knew that it would never get passed if it was called tax increment financing because it sounds like a new tax and it's it's capturing property tax it's not new tax but what they called them were self-financing bonds and um so <laughs> it's amazing what you uh repackage and reskin it but uh, apparently by naming it self-financing bonds they were able to get it passed so um yeah i think digging into that that sounds like a great idea matt um being able to put together um some of the ways that it works best in wyoming that's what that's what Pam and Rollins used Rollins for their downtown that, project, right? Uh, grants, not yeah. yeah. In the facade where they eased, did the easement back, the easement. I guess, yep. to public. Yeah. Yep. So, but not tax increment. Right. Yeah. So, I'm the tax increment thing to me is it's difficult concept in Wyoming the way that our property tax is yeah. structured. So, yeah. We've got we've got some models on it that may help to explain kind of how it can help. It's not a silver bullet, but you know, it's it's basically here we have to use every possible tool that we can to to make things viable. We, we had a city that did a TIF and then offered tax abatements to all the new developers. So the TIF never <laughs> nothing ever happened because they abated all the property tax. So oh tax abatement. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was an interesting tool compounded with the historic tax credit and the and MTCs yep. and the opportunities, and even though we haven't really seen the, the OCE used here. Yeah, I'm interested to learn, so that's cool. Excellent, excellent. All right. Well, well good deal. Well, guys. thanks for bearing with us with the technology yeah. issues, and hopefully this was worth it, so. I think it was. All right. It's exciting. Thank you, Ben. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Package here yeah. soon, so. Great. All right. It's exciting, I Thank think. Thank you. Lots to think about and tools to use. So indeed, indeed. So well, we get to hop in the car and head to Rollins and do this all over again. It's so. <laughs> <laughs> just luck. <Yeah. laughs> and hope that the wind's not howling yeah. like mild. Maybe exactly. Push, you know? Yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks so Thank much, you everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Go sell it. Thanks, Ben. All right, Matt. I'll talk to you in a little while, bud. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, sir. Drive safe. Thanks. <laughs>